Good evening and happy Sabbath. If you wouldn't mind, I'm just going to bow my head and pray one more time. Father in heaven, I ask that as I speak this morning, that your Holy Spirit would be able to speak to every single person here as well as to me, and that we would learn both treasures new and old from the Bible, that we can see and, and see the beauty of you in it. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to start with telling you a story. Um, a couple in, in 2013, they, they lived out in California, and they lived out in the country, and they were going on a nice walk out in the woods with their dog, and they were walking along, and they, they noticed in the moss, sticking out of the moss a little bit, there was a tin can, but it was, well, maybe it wasn't tin, but it was a can. It was very rusted. And they were kind of curious. They hadn't seen that can ever before when they had been walking. It kind of looked like it had been buried for a while. And so they were curious, so they went and dug it out, and it felt heavy, so they thought, well, let's take it home and see what it is. So they came home and opened it up, and what do you think was inside? Rocks? Maybe? Money. You're right. It was money. It wasn't just any money. It was gold coins. And it was the, the years were like from, you know, 1847 to 1894, like gold rush kind of coins. And they were in like mint shape, you know, like perfect. And they thought, I wonder if there's any more. <laughs> and so they went back and they, they dug around the ground some more and they found eight cans full of these gold coins. And they, they had about, I think, 1,400 coins altogether when they counted them all up. But all together, <laughs> um, the couple is, is now kind of famous because they, they're trying to be anonymous, of course, but they're famous because it is believed that this is the, the largest stash of hidden treasure that has ever been found in North America. And the total value of it all together is about $11 million. Now, how would you like to go for a walk like that? <laughs> One day, you're just normal walking your dog, and you come back <laughs> being a, a millionaire. And I tell this story because it's a story that, you know, it, it creates excitement in us. We would love to find that kind of treasure if we were walking. And, you know, we can all kind of relate to wanting to find that. And, you know, maybe you haven't found $11 million, but maybe you found, you know, some money on the ground, $5, $1. Even that does something for you, you know? Wow, I found something kind of special. But even Jesus knew that we had that, that feeling, that we could relate to wanting to find something valuable and to be able to, to get it for ourselves, to be able to enjoy it. So we're going to look at the story. It's a familiar parable. It's actually one of the shortest Jesus told. It's in Matthew 13. So if you would turn in your Bibles with me, Matthew 13, verse 44. And like I said, this, uh, we want to find treasures new and old, so the story might be familiar to many of you, but maybe there will be a new take on it that maybe you haven't heard before. And I just ask that the Holy Spirit will be able to help us learn all something from it. It reads, Matthew 13, 44, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for the joy thereof goeth and sell all that he hath, and buyeth that field. All right, so we know this is a parable, and parables are stories that are told to teach a, a spiritual lesson, Right? And so we know that the literal situations, the literal symbols that are in the story, they represent spiritual things, right? So before we take a look at this story much further, we want to identify what are these literal elements that we're going to have to find spiritual correlations to. So we have, of course, the man in the story. You know, he's going to find the treasure. We have the field. We have the hidden treasure. And we have selling all. So first, let's take a look at this hidden treasure. Now, if you look in the Bible and just do a word search on treasure, you'll get maybe like, I got 35 different hits. But the Bible is a little bit more specific in this story. It's not just any treasure. What kind of treasure is it? Hidden treasure. Okay, so that's a little bit more specific. Um, and it's 
a, a spiritual application. So that narrowed it down a little bit more. So I would invite you to turn with me to Colossians chapter 2, verse 3. And here the Bible talks about hidden treasure. So it reads, In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Okay, so here we have a treasure, and it is hid. But what does it say this treasure is? Wisdom and knowledge. Hmm. Now, when I think of treasure, I usually think of, you know, like pirate's treasure or maybe like those, those gold coins in the ground or something, you know, tangible gems or, you know, something like that. But when the Bible talks about treasure, it's talking about wisdom and knowledge. But still, you know, why does the Bible say treasure is wisdom and knowledge? Now, if you're talking about wisdom and knowledge, who's the most authoritative person on that in the Bible? Solomon, okay, he had a lot to know about wisdom and knowledge. Of course, Jesus does know everything, but we want to take a look. What does Solomon have to say? Maybe he can help us understand why it's so precious that it's called a treasure. So if you would go with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 11 and 12. We'll read about wisdom and knowledge and see what's so special about it. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, starting with verse 11. Wisdom is good with an inheritance, and by it there is profit to them that see the sun. For wisdom a defense is a defense, and money is a defense. But the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life to them that have it. So here, Solomon, he's comparing money and, and, and wisdom. Wisdom and knowledge are kind of grouped together. And he's saying both are good. You know, you can, you can get a lot of things with money. Money is a defense. But there's something about wisdom and knowledge that makes it superior than anything money will ever be able to get you. And what's that? Life. Now, is this talking about just any kind of life? No, it's talking about eternal life. Because there's nothing that money will ever be able to buy that will be able to take you from this life to heaven. Nothing. And so he's saying all the money that you have, all the other things in the world, it's not as valuable as the knowledge that leads to eternal life. If you can find that knowledge, that is precious. That is worth everything. So that is his, his uh, explanation of why wisdom and knowledge is something so valuable. Wisdom comes from above. Knowledge comes from God. It can give you eternal life. So now we have an idea of what this hidden treasure is, something that leads to eternal life. Eternal life, salvation, leading to heaven, eternal life. But then we have a couple other elements we need to figure out. So what's the field that the treasure is hidden in? And what does that have to do with obtaining eternal life? If hidden, hidden treasure is eternal life and relating to that, how? Wh what's the field to do with it? So to find that answer, we've got to go back to the first verse that we started with, Colossians 2, verse 3 because the Bible gives us that answer right in that verse. And it says, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In whom. It's not even a place, it's a whom. So who's the whom? Look back in the previous verse right before it. What is the last person that's mentioned? The in whom. Christ. Christ. The, the knowledge of eternal life, the gift of salvation, the the life, eternal life, is found in Christ. He is who it's found in. Now, I want you to go back to Matthew 13, and we're going to look at the story, and we're going to notice some, something kind of strange. The man, he's going along in the field, and he hits the treasure. He finds it. He discovers it. He sees its value. But then he does something very Strange. What does he do? He hides it. Now, I don't know if that seems strange to you, but if you were rototilling out in your garden and you found some cans in the ground, you know, and it looked like there might be some gold in or something, would your first instinct be to like, cover it all up or to take it in the kitchen and take a look at it? I don't know about you, but I'd want to take it and take a look at it and see what was in it. So why is it that this man doesn't do that? Any ideas? All right, I think I heard the answer out there. It is in the story itself. 
it's not his field. If it was his field, he would have no problem with it, taking it right out of the ground and going taking a look at it. But because it's not his field, he can't just take it. And now I, I want you to think about the spiritual applications of this, because we're going to kind of be going back and forth. But now we're getting the idea. We can start to think about this. What does this really mean? Because spiritually, this man is like many of you. He's like me. Was this man looking for treasure? No. Now, there are parables that talk about people who are looking for treasure. He was not. He was just minding his own business, plowing his field. But he stumbles on this treasure. He just kind of stumbles on it. And maybe that was like you. Maybe you were never looking for the treasure. Um, maybe it just one day kind of you stumbled upon that knowledge for the first time. Now, you know this man, he probably had been working in this field before that day probably, or at least he had been working hours in the field before he found the treasure. And I'm sure that as he was plowing, he had gone beside it and around it, maybe even on top of it, but he hadn't discovered it yet. And maybe, you, maybe you're like me. Maybe you were raised in a Christian home. You went to Sabbath school. You, you were in lots of places where that treasure could be found and discovered, but maybe you never discovered it. You were like plowing off to the side or on top, but you never found it for yourself. But then one day, you discovered it. Now, maybe it was, you know, you were you know, studying the Bible and devotions, and it, it just hit you what eternal life and the offer that God has really means to you. Maybe it was in a, a sermon that you heard or you were listening to. God speaks to us in many different ways. But maybe one day, you weren't necessarily looking for it, but you suddenly realized the treasure of eternal life that you have been plowing all around. And you discovered its worth for the first time. But this story teaches something very important. Because it teaches that even though you, you might know what eternal life is and, and salvation and the gift that God can give us, you might know about it and you might want it, just because you discovered the treasure doesn't mean that you have it. And do you think there are many people out in this world that want to go to heaven? Yeah. There are many people that are hoping and desiring to go there. But just because you hope and you desire doesn't mean that you'll get there. So just because we know it doesn't mean we do it. I know that can happen to me too. That <laughs> happens a lot. Many, many people today are they're stumbling across this treasure, and some, they recognize it. Maybe you recognized it. But now, what are you going to do? So let's go and see what the man in the story does. So back to the story, he finds it, he hides it, because no, he knows it's not his yet. He knows it's not his, so what does he do? Okay, he goes and he sells all that he has. Now, I think we know that this is not talking in the literal connotation. It is a parable. So, you know, the Bible is not saying that we have to sell everything and, and live like a, a monastic, ascetic lives here. But he is trying to help us to understand a, a spiritual symbolism of what selling all represents. And... First, I want to be clear about something that this story illustrates and makes very plain. Did he buy the treasure? No. He did not buy the treasure. Now, how do we know that from just common sense? We, let, let's just say the man, he liquidated all his, his assets, his house, everything that he owned, and maybe he had $50,000. And then he goes and he gets the treasure, and it's, it's worth $45,000. Would the man have sold everything that he had to get that? No. What if, he, what if the treasure was worth $50,000? Would he have sold everything? No. Why not? It's the same value. I mean, he could buy it, but he's not left with anything more than what he started with. So in order to want to sell everything that you have, it's got to be much more than you could ever buy much more. You can never buy it. 
So what is this saying? What is this saying? Do you think that if I am a vegetarian all my life, that that will help earn me heaven? What if, what if I, I don't watch all the worldly music and I don't watch the worldly movies? Will that earn me heaven? No? What about dressing a certain way or speaking a certain way? Will that earn me heaven? No? So that means that nothing I can ever do, nothing will ever buy me that treasure, that treasure of eternal life that God gives to us, nothing I ever have. Because God says, even your righteousness, the things that you do that are good, you're like filthy rags. So there's nothing that we can do to merit us eternal life. Nothing. He can never buy that treasure. But the parable doesn't end with hopelessness. The man saying, man, I can never, I can never buy this treasure. I'm just going to be really sad and depressed and go on my way. It doesn't end that way. Neither does it end with him just taking the treasure and walking off with it. Now, there, often in Christianity, there are extremes that we have to deal with. There are people who, when they, they see how, how bad their life is, they're like, I am so bad. I could never be good enough for God. I, don't, I can't even try. And there are those who, they would feel, oh, I can't, I, I can't buy the treasure. I give up. There are other people that say, ah, oh, eternal life, it's wonderful, it's great, let me take it. And they, they make this treasure very cheap. They make it very cheap. But this parable, there's more to the story than either of those options. This man knows that neither of those options are the right way to do it. So he follows a different path. What does he go and buy? The field. Okay, so what was the field again? Jesus, okay. We buy Jesus? Now let's try to think about this. Now, you, we've just been talking about how nothing, nothing, nothing we can do can ever buy the treasure. Nothing we can do. Even our good actions are nothing. And now you're telling me, buy Jesus. But what am I going to buy him with? You've just knocked out everything I had to offer. So what? Now, <laughs> the Bible has used paradoxical language, things that don't always make sense before. Um, I think we're all familiar with the, the verse in Revelation 3, 18. And it says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thy eyes with eyes have that thou mayest see. So here, Jesus is saying buy. Buy with what? And then we know the song, we sing it, um, Isaiah 55, 1. It says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. He that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Without money, without price, but come and buy. All right, so what is this saying? I mean, we're told in explicit terms, you can't buy the treasure. There's nothing you can do with the treasure. But come and buy. You have to buy it. All right, so what does Ellen might have to say about this? She asks the same question we're asking. She says, then how can we buy the Son of God as our treasure? How can we buy him? It is simply to give back to Jesus his own. To receive him into the heart by faith, it is cooperation with God. All right. So Jesus, he doesn't want your possessions. He has enough of those already. He doesn't want your good actions even. He just wants you. He wants your cooperation. He wants everything of you. He wants your complete, undivided loyalty to him. In Matthew 6, 21, it's also talking about treasure. It says, for where your treasure is, there your heart also will be. Now, in this story, where is the treasure? In the field. So if, you're, if you have this treasure, if you have the treasure of eternal life, where will your heart be? It will be with Jesus. It will be in that field. It will be with Jesus. Ellen White talks about 
how who has our hearts, with whom are our thoughts, upon whom do we love to converse, who has our warmest affections, our best energies. If we are on the Lord's side, our thoughts are with him, our sweetest thoughts are of him. We have no friendship with the world. We have consecrated all that we have and are to him. So we know salvation, this eternal life, this great hidden treasure, it's a free gift. It's so priceless. It's so beyond anything that we could ever pay for. It's, there's no way we could do anything for it. But we can only receive it a certain way. In 1 John 5:12. It says, he that hath the sun hath life. If you have the field, you have the treasure that's hidden in the field. He that hath the sun hath life. But the only way to have eternal life is through Jesus, and the only way you can have Jesus is if Jesus has you. In in Luke 16, uh, verse 13, it explains why Jesus can never be the master of a divided heart. It says, no master can serve, no, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. So when we are willing, when I am willing to sell all, to give myself completely to God in full cooperation with him, when I say, God, I have nothing, I have nothing to offer but just me. That's when Jesus says, that's all I'm ever asking. That's the price. That's everything. But God waits until everything. He waits until everything. Imagine if that man had, you know, he knows this treasure, he wants this treasure, and he goes home, and he looks around, he's like, yeah, I don't really like that. I can get rid of that. Yeah, that one I could live without. And he sells almost everything, but there's just one thing that's like his favorite thing that he just can't imagine life without. He's like, I'll sell everything but that one thing. Do you think he would have had enough money to buy the land? No, he wouldn't have. And he would have lost that on, who knows, billions of dollars of treasure for some little thing. Some little thing. Maybe we could do the same thing. Could be just one thing, just one unsurrendered habit, one uh, one unsurrendered opinion. It might not not even be the habits that we think of, you know, like smoking or or watching, you know, things we shouldn't see or, or listening to things. It might be pride. It might be wanting people's attention on us could be many different things but there could be some one thing in each of our lives that's keeping us from having all that we need to buy that field all to have that unsurrendered heart now when we tend to talk about you know surrendering all surrendering kind of has a negative connotation it's kind of like oh i surrender it's a sacrifice But I want to ask you, do you think that this was a great sacrifice for the man to make? Okay, no. Because if we said yes, then we didn't understand what the man in the story understood. Because he, what what does the parable say that he does when he goes and sells everything? It says he goes with joy. Now, when you're sacrificing something, do you go with joy? No, he went with joy. And why? Because he knew that whatever he had was really junk in comparison to what he could get. And he knew that, you know, if he had something good then, he could get something far better with it once he got that treasure. And that's the same way with with us and God. There are things that we hold on to and we can't imagine life without, but God's saying, if you just let me take care of your life, I'll give you something far better than what you could even dream of. Everything in our life, when we hold on to it, it's really junk in comparison to what God can offer us. Paul, he knows this. He knows this. In Philippians chapter 3, he talks about this experience. He's gone through it. He's bought the field. It says, but what things were gained to me, 
those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Paul, he's saying, I, I give up everything. Everything is, is dung to me, you know. I, I would give up everything just to win Christ, to get Christ. He says, I would sell everything to buy that field, to gain that treasure that's within Jesus. Now, when we make those decisions to sell everything that we have, people may think we are a bit crazy. Now, imagine you live next to this guy, you were a neighbor, and you saw him one day, and he comes back from the field, and he you know, puts like a yard sale sign in the yard, and he sells everything, and you're like, what's happening? And he's like, I'm selling everything, and he has this big smile on his face, and you know, he looks really excited, and like everything goes. Now think about it maybe in a more modern, modern setting, a real yard sale, what kinds of things would be in that yard sale? His, uh, his car, his motorcycle, his favorite clothes, his iPad, his computer. You might think he was a bit crazy too. And you know what? Most of the world, when they look at Christians, they think we're pretty crazy. Because when they look, they just see the field. And the field looks pretty ordinary to them. When they look at Jesus, they see a pretty ordinary man. They can't see the treasure that we have found. And so that when we tell, and we're, we're joyful, and we're excited, and we're like, we're selling everything to buy this field, they're like, you're crazy. There's nothing there. <laughs> but, but we know we're not crazy. It doesn't matter what they think. Because the next day, when that man came back and he showed everyone the treasure, do you think they thought he was crazy anymore? <laughs> no, they probably wished they had gone to the field first. So the world might think you are a bit crazy at times, but that's certainly no reason why we shouldn't sell everything, because we know something they don't. In closing, I would like you to think about this story and where you might be in this story. Now, we started out, the man was just plowing in the field, and there was a point that he had never discovered the treasure. He was in the right place, but he hadn't discovered it yet. And there might be some of you here that you're in the right place, or you have been in the right places at different points in your life, but you haven't yet discovered the value of that treasure for yourself yet you can discover that treasure today. Now, there might be others of you that you found it. You, you know that that's something you want. When people talk about eternal life, when they talk about the relationship with Jesus, the peace that it brings, you want it. You value it. You say, wow, that sounds so good. It all sounds too good to be true. Like, like finding a million dollars on a walk, but I would like to find it if I could. Maybe you, you hope and you desire to have that. You can be in this story by saying, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to go and buy that field. I'm not just going to sit on the knowledge. I'm, I'm going to go and buy that field so I can actually have it. And there may be some of you who've already done that. You've already bought the field. You have that relationship with Jesus. But the thing is, this story repeats every single day. So even you have a task. Every single day you get up, you have the decision of buying that field again, of communicating with God and saying, God, everything that I have is actually yours. Like Ellen White said, it's just returning what's already his. He's already bought us by his blood, and we're just returning something that already belongs to him. We're saying, God, I, I don't have anything worth to offer, but I do give myself, and that's all that he asks. 
you can do that. In Proverbs 23, 26, it says, My son, give me thine heart. And we know that Jesus will say, Give me your heart, and I will give you a new one. I'll give you the eternal treasure. So I ask, are you ready to buy that field today? Do you want to buy that? If that is your desire, if you want to ask Jesus, God, I want that treasure. I want to know you. I want to give you everything that I have. I want to sell all to get that field. If that is your desire, please kneel with me today. Father in heaven, I know that I was once plowing in that field a long time before I ever discovered the true value of that treasure that was there all along. But I am so thankful that I did find it. But I know that even when I did find it, I didn't quite know what to do. I didn't know, I, wa I, I wasn't quite willing to sell everything. And the reason was because I really didn't comprehend the value of that treasure. And I ask that for each one of us here, if there is one thing in our life that we aren't willing to give to you yet, that you would help us to see that you have something much, much better to give us. And that treasure, that eternal life, that gift of salvation that you have to offer, it's just waiting, just waiting for us when we open our hearts to you. We invite you we give ourselves to you. It's all that we have to offer, but that's the price. All or nothing. So please take our hearts and give us that treasure tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.